<laughs> a couple quick housekeeping details. Uh, checkout is supposed to be at 10. Obviously, we're going to be in this room, so we're going to be a little bit running behind. But on your way into your morning sessions, drop off your room keys if you haven't already done something like that. And uh, if you're still in the cabin with the stuff, as soon as we're done here, bolt up to the cabin, empty your stuff, and then come to your session because they really want us to get out so we can clean up. Evaluations, those little pink forms in the back, we actually use those, believe it or not. You know, that's our entertainment this week is to read all the comments that come in and sort of figure out what it is we're going to do, not just, um, not just at next year's Farmer to Farmer conference, but also in terms of other workshops that people are looking for. Um, some thank yous. Abby, who's hiding in the back. Yay. Yeah. We don't know how hard it is for Abby to get the rest of the staff to actually do the things that need to happen, but she's very effective at it. Um, it's so good to see um, the next generation of new farmers who seem to have just sprouted over the last year. Um, and I say that in the whole continuum. Uh, people who've been coming to Farmer to Farmer since they were really little, who are now actually participating in sessions. Jen and Rob's kids, um, the Taylor Lash boys, and, a, and the Gerritsen kids. You know, they've come through the whole cycle of coming to these conferences and being held, and now they're actually jumping in and working on their farms. and. Uh, Here's the next generation starting to emerge, and it's really exciting. So all these little little ones that you hear in the back of the room squeaking a little bit now and then, that's where it all starts, is just absorbing it all. And it's really amazing and powerful how it happens. So thank you all for uh, making this a multi-generation event. It's really fun. Um, our keynote this morning is Molly Anderson. Molly is about a year into um, the Get the right one, the Partridge Chair of Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems at the College of the Atlantic. And that's a long title for basically saying, yeah. Molly's there spreading yeah. ideas. And uh, she's been at this for a while now. She worked at Tufts University in the Food and Nutrition Program for a long time. She's worked for Heifer Project. She's been involved in all of the major conversations around the country for years on how do we change agricultural policy. And after Tuesday, I think we have a little bit of work to do, and we're the people who are going to do it. So Molly, help us figure out what we need to be thinking about. Molly. Thanks, Russell. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it is wonderful to look out there and see so many young people. Uh, it's unusual for a farmer gathering in this country, as I'm sure you, you realize. Uh, it's one of the, the problems with our, our agricultural system and food system, that we don't have enough folks like you out there, and like you in every sense of the word, like you in terms of values, like you in age mix, like you in terms of the kinds of practices that you're using on your farms. Um, this is probably not a crowd that I need to point out that there's some major things we need to change in our food system. But that's where I'm going to start. Uh, some of the thorniest problems to me, and I've been, been trying to deal with different aspects of food system reform for probably 20 years. Russell was very, very kind. He said I'd been at it for a while, but long enough to to get gray hair working on this. Some of the thorniest problems are really how we can make food accessible and affordable while keeping prices well above the cost of production for farmers, especially those farmers who are paying their workers living wages. That to me is the million dollar question in uh, sustainable agriculture right now. And we clearly need to figure out better strategies to answer these challenges than we have now in the United States at the federal and the state level if the United States food system is going to become anything close to sustainable. And I'd like to say if the US food system will continue to be strong and continue to be the um, source of strong rural communities. What I'm 
going to do today is focus on a few questions. Uh, some of this may be old news to you. I hope there's at least some in here that's, that's new for you. The main questions right now that I'll be dealing with are, what's the current status of access to healthy food in the United States? Why are so many people in the United States hungry for real food? Why are we unable to get real food to so many people in this country? And finally, who's taking action now and how in this country? What would change if we considered food as a right? And then finally, what can farmers do? How much power do you actually have? So starting out, the status of access to healthy food. The place where conversations about access to food and access to healthy food usually begins is uh, with the concept of food security. Um, food security is simply having access at all times to enough food for a healthy, active life for all household members. A lot of people like to add in having access to culturally appropriate food and having access to food that's grown in environmentally sustainable ways. And I know that's really important to you folks, but technically this is the definition of food security that's used in the United States simply having access to sufficient food. The numbers of people who are food insecure in this country have skyrocketed uh, over the last couple of years. And we'll get into the reasons in just a few minutes. A lot of those reasons are obvious. But in 2008, which is the last year that we have good data analyzed, the new report will be coming out sometime this month, probably within a couple of, of weeks, but the new report is just going to, to be reporting on data from 2009. All indications are that the, the numbers of people who are food insecure in 2009 will be even greater than the numbers showing up on these, this data from um, USDA for food insecurity in 2008. For reasons that I think you understand quite well, unemployment is not really down, and despite all the brouhaha about the end of the, the recession, we're not really seeing that, especially not in rural areas where unemployment remains really high. But in 2008, the number, the year where we had the last good data, almost 15% of households were food insecure at least sometime during that year. That was up from 11% in 2007, and it's the highest recorded prevalence of food insecurity since numbers first started to be analyzed in 1995. That was when the first national food security uh, survey was conducted. So food insecurity was holding pretty steady at around 11%. And then suddenly 2008, we see a big jump up to about 15%. And this is a big jump when we're talking about the numbers of people who are affected. It's almost 50 million households. Um, well, actually 50 million people living in food insecure households. That includes close to 17 million children. Of these people, uh, 12 million adults and 5 million children live in households with what USDA likes to call very low food security. We used to just call this hunger, and to all practical purposes, it is hunger. It's households where people don't know where the next meal is coming from. The households that have the worst food insecurity status are not surprisingly those households that have incomes below the official poverty line. The official poverty line is remarkably low, by the way. It's uh, $21,834 for a family of four in 2008. 42% of households with um, incomes below this poverty line we're food insecure, but as you can see, if you look at uh, that line, I don't have a pointer, sorry about that, I should have brought one along, but where it says income to poverty ratio, even for people who have almost twice this official poverty line, uh, so close to $42,000, 43000 for um, a household of, of four, you're seeing uh, more than 30% of those households are food insecure. So poor households are doing the worst. 
The second category of people who are really suffering from food insecurity in this country are households with children headed by a single woman. 37% of these households are food insecure. It's a lot of kids who are living in food insecure households. The next group, the next two groups really, that have disproportionately high prevalence of food insecurity are Hispanic households at about 27% in 2008 and black households at about 26% uh, in 2008, and that's under that line, race, ethnicity of head of household. Now, where are people being affected worst? Well, not all that surprisingly, in the states that have relatively low incomes and the states that have relatively high numbers of households that are black, Hispanic, and uh, single mothers living with children. Maine's not doing so well here. Food insecurity is above the U.S. average here. The consequences of this uh, are probably clear to you, but let me just run through them. These are consequences that our country will be dealing with for at least the next generation and probably more. The consequences are failure to thrive in babies. My husband uh, works at Boston University at Boston Medical Center with a group of pediatricians who are dealing with these babies babies who come into the clinic and they're tiny. They're not growing in the way they should be because they're not getting the food they should be getting. Anemia is another uh, widespread consequence of food insecurity. General poor health in children, these kids are a lot more vulnerable to all kinds of problems. They have a greater likelihood of experiencing health problems that require hospitalization. And now we get into th the things that are really going to be damaging to our whole country. Low cognitive ability and learning outcomes for these children. All of us will suffer because these 17 million children are living in food insecure households. The kids who we're depending on as a country to be taking care of us in our old age won't have the wherewithal to get the good jobs and earn money that basically will keep us going when we're in old age. These kids also have more behavioral problems and more mental health problems. The moms have mental health problems too, not surprisingly. Uh, higher depression and generalized anxiety disorder. And there's a lot of lost productivity in adults from sick days and caring for sick children. So food insecurity is a big problem, not just for these these um, 49 million people living in food insecure households, but really for all of us and for the national economy. And we haven't quite caught on to that as a country, that this is something that's in the public interest to fix and to fix completely. We have the power to fix this completely. So it's not just food insecurity when we're talking about status of access to healthy food. It's also problems with the quality of food that people are eating in this country. This chart is from a study that's done every year called America's Children, Key National Indicators of Well-Being. And I'm not going to try to walk you through the whole chart, but if you look at this, this set of bars that is labeled at the bottom DGOV, that means dark green and orange vegetables the kinds of things that are probably plentiful on your tables. If you look at these bars, you can see that for all age ranges, kids are not getting the, the quantity of dark green and orange vegetables that they should be getting. And even though two to five year olds are getting much better now in getting total fruit and a little better in getting total vegetables that they need, should I be using that? Right oh, good. Thank you. Um, oh, ask and you shall receive. Um, even though things are, are getting slightly better, our kids are still not eating ne anywhere near the quantity of servings of fresh fruits and vegetables that they should be eating. Now, part of what happens when you don't have kids eating the right kind of diet and you don't have adults eating the right kind of diet is obesity. And you're well aware that adult obesity and child obesity is growing at really serious rates. 
Uh, Maine, again, not showing up so well. Adult obesity is 25.8% in Maine, I believe. This is 2009. These figures are from the, um, it, it's the best federal figures that we can get for obesity for the center, from the Centers for Disease Control. And in some population groups, particularly African Americans, the figures are much higher. In the map down at the bottom corner, well, we'll, we'll let that be. Uh, you can see very well the, bot down, the map down at the bottom corner. These are showing uh, prevalence of black obesity in the United States in 2008. And when you see maps that have a lot of red and purple and orange, that's a pretty clear indication that something's wrong. Something's very wrong, very wrong, that the kind of food that you are producing is not getting to the people who most need it. This is showing the change in obesity among teenagers between uh, the 19, around 1990 and 2007 to 2008 with the green bar on the right showing the more recent figures, the blue bar, the earlier figures, and consistently uh, for all demographic groups, obesity is going up for teenagers. Not good. The consequences of obesity, some of these are similar to consequences of food insecurity, but what we see for obesity is an increasing prevalence of diet-related diseases that are costing our country a fortune now and that threaten to really swamp our public health system in the next few decades as more and more people who were obese as children and teenagers rise into adulthood and start showing these diet-related diseases that are four of the top 10 killers in the United States now. Diabetes top, type two is escalating uh, at a, a really alarming rate. Kids who are obese have poor school performance, uh, low teacher ratings of social behavior, increased risk of obesity as an adult, uh, correlations with type two diabetes, stroke, heart disease, some cancers, gallbladder problems, sleep apnea, depression. I, I, I will get into things that are a little bit cheerier. I, I promise. <laughs> But we need to get through this just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what's going on with access to healthy food. And there are also very serious financial problems, as I mentioned. The treatment of obesity-related conditions was about 9% of all medical spending in the United States in 2008. That's a total of $147 billion spent on obesity-related conditions. That was up from about 6% just a decade earlier. Um, obese Americans, and that's about a third of, of adults through the country, spend about $1,500 more annually on health care than normal weight Americans. A lot of this is for drugs. Now, you might think that obesity and food insecurity are opposite ends of the spectrum. They're frequently presented that way, that we have these uh, paradoxically, we have a, a rise in obesity at the same time that we have a rise in food insecurity. But they're actually closely related. I have come to think recently of obesity as a metaphor for what's going on in our country with respect for food. Obesity reflects a hunger for real food. It's a metaphor for overconsumption in every domain of US life. Overconsumption that's been promulgated by media and by government policies over the last few decades. What could be worse, really, than eating and eating and eating and never being satisfied? And to me, that stems from eating the wrong kind of food. The wrong kind of food in a metaphorical sense, as well as a literal sense. I showed you that we're not eating, our kids aren't eating enough dark green uh, and orange vegetables, but we're also not eating the right kinds of values, the right kinds of beliefs, the right kinds of hopes. And to me, that's a lot of what the obesity crisis is about. It's hunger for meaning and hunger for real food coming from our food system. 
So, why is this going on? Why are so many people in the United States food insecure, obese, and hungry for real food? Some of the, the issues are pretty obvious. It's unemployment and low income. People can't afford to buy food at the prices that it is currently being sold for in just about every place. This is not farmers' fault by any means. Consumers sometimes point to farmers and say, you should be giving us cheaper food. You should be giving us really good food at low prices. But this is not farmers' fault or farmers' responsibility. We have decades of cheap food policy, and that's basically the problem. The wrong kinds of food have been subsidized and kept artificially cheap. So now it's a lot cheaper to buy Coca-Cola than to buy juice. It's a lot cheaper to buy chips and to fill yourself up on low quality food than it is to buy good food. And I know it's possible to do that, but given the food environment, food deserts where it's hard to get to uh, full service supermarkets and there aren't enough farmers markets or farm stands, or food swamps, which are places where there's plenty of food and even healthy food, but it's completely lost in this barrage of ads and availability of really junky food. So some of the reasons are pretty easy to see. Food swamps, unemployment that leads to low income, um, lack of living wages in the United States, cheap food policy, food swamps, food deserts. And here's, I'm going to show you two slides that to me encapsulate a lot of what's wrong with our cheap food policy and federal ag and food policy generally. This is showing on the left federal subsidies for food production by type of food between 1995 and 2005. Meat and dairy took the hog share of subsidies. Vegetables and fruits were only subsidized for less than 1% of total federal subsidies going to food production. And here on the right, just to remind you, is what we should be eating, and it's almost a direct reverse. The foods that we should be eating are not being subsidized. The foods we're not eating enough of are not getting subsidies. And it's not necessarily the case that vegetable farmers should all be getting the same subsidies that uh, uh, the large-scale hog and cattle farmers should be getting. I'm not convinced that that's the answer. But there's clearly a skew here of perverse subsidies that are propping up a really unhealthy food system. This next one, given that I woke up an hour early, I, I missed the time shift, maybe some of the rest of you did too. Uh, I had a chance to look at the New York Times front page this morning. And this was on the front page. It was an article about how USDA at the same time is pushing more cheese consumption, the same time that it's telling consumers that we should be eating less cheese and less saturated fats. This chart down at the bottom is showing the increase in consumption of cheese uh, between 1970 and 2008. The average person eats 33 pounds of cheese in a year, and that's an awful lot of saturated fat. Between cheese and Coca-Cola and other soft drinks, you don't really need to look farther for uh, a reason for why more people are getting obese. It's pretty obvious. Um, one quarter of a Domino's pizza, and this is one of the success stories that USDA is pointing to in its marketing strategies, that it's, it's worked with Domino Pizza to increase the amount of cheese that it can, can put on a, a pizza. One serving, gives you 77% of your day's saturated fat intake. That's an awful lot of fat. Uh, in the same USDA report that was talking about successful marketing strategies, they discussed this Domino's pizza that has, or, or Domino's pizza that has six cheeses on the top and then two cheeses in the crust. We don't really need that much cheese. But, 
It's one good way to be pushing more cheese. And it's not you guys who are really benefiting from that kind of subsidy and that kind of marketing strategy. This is something that Dairy Management Inc. Uh, is doing with checkoff funds, working with USDA to push cheese consumption way beyond what's healthy. And then what's behind that? Uh, the crazy federal policies uh, where we have conflicts between nutrition advice and marketing advice, and we have subsidies going in entirely the wrong direction, is really crazy federal policies where we have way too much money going into military spending. This is one of those sacred cows in Washington. The United States spends almost half of total world spending, of uh, military spending. We're spending half of that. And our, our next runner-up is Europe that's spending only 20%. So the United States alone is spending more than the next 40 countries below us on the military. This isn't good for us. This isn't good for our rural communities. In addition to this waste of money in wars that we can't win, we are having to cope as a country with the people who return from these wars, who are shattered and damaged. I'm sure many of you have close contact with veterans. This is a terrible tragedy that our whole country has to deal with. Another example of skewed priorities was this huge bank bailout. It wasn't small farmers that were getting a bailout. It wasn't small families and rural communities that were getting a bailout when the financial crisis hit. It was the big banks. If we look at the data on why people are food insecure and hungry for real food, the data will show us that where people live makes a big difference. This is basically the characteristics of their food environment, whether they live in a food desert or a food swamp. Some of the other things that make a really big difference, according to the studies, are average wages, not surprisingly, whether people on average are receiving a living wage for their work, the cost of housing, levels of participation in food assistance programs, and a lot of people are embarrassed to participate in food assistance programs. There's still a real stigma attached to those. Tax policies, whether we're taxing um, regressively, so the tax falls on low-income people more, or taxing people who have benefited from the last few decades of federal tax policy. And heating and cooling costs. This really hits in the Northeast, where low-income households, especially those with only elderly people, are more likely to experience very low food insecurity during the winter, uh, when heating costs are really high. So behind these skewed policies, I look pretty directly to what's happening politically. Um, the influx of secret donations into campaigns that we saw uh, bearing fruit with the Tuesday elections. Here's uh, Mitch McDonnell on the right uh, saying that the biggest priority for the next two years is to make sure that Mr. Obama doesn't get reelected. The biggest priority when we're dealing with unemployment and two wars, two endless wars, this is crazy. And the only way we can get rid of this is by engaging more politically. Okay, let's look at how we're dealing as a country. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. How we're dealing now with uh, food insecurity and obesity and this hunger for real food. The numbers on this chart, don't worry if you can't read them because they're out of date, this is an old chart. But there are a couple of things that I wanted to point out about this. Uh, the emergency food network, and one out of four people in the United States now takes advantage of this emergency food network at some point during the year, consists of both federal programs there across the top and private programs at the bottom. Now, local food sources, the kind of food that you're growing, is not entering these federal programs in a substantial way. 
So these one in four people who are taking advantage of federal programs are not eating your food, except through some rather small programs. Some of them are eating healthy food that you produce through the private system that's set up. The biggest program that's in place now at the federal level to uh, feed hungry people is the food stamp program, which was renamed, renamed the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, um, in the last farm bill. The number of Americans who are receiving food stamps reached almost 40 million in February of 2010. This was the highest number since the SNAP program began in 1939. So we're seeing a lot more applicants to SNAP, this food assistance program, correlating with the higher rates of food insecurity. As of November 2009, one in eight Americans and one in four children used food stamps, and the program rate was growing at 20,000 people per day. Now, to participate in, in SNAP, to get food stamps, you have to be pretty low income. You have to not be making much money at all. So this is an awful lot of people who basically aren't making it. The amount that people get, in case something's flickering through your mind that you've heard that people on food stamps are gouging the system, that's simply not true. The amount that people get on food stamps is an average of 130 $33 per person in 2009. This amount is nowhere near sufficient to lift a family out of poverty or to cover the cost of a healthy diet. It's enough to buy those cheap foods that contribute to the overall uh, lack of diet quality in our country. So in a sense, the food stamp program is perpetuating, it's intricately tied in with this cheap food policy in the United States. The National School Lunch Program is the second biggest program with 30 million kids, more than half, participating every school day. Meals are subsidized, by the way, even for kids who are paying full price for school lunches. They're still getting a subsidy. And WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children Program, uh, served more than 25% of children aged one through four, and uh, more than half of infants that are born in the United States. A good program, and they've started getting more fresh fruits and vegetables into the program, but that's, that's still an add-on. So the private feeding program on the line below is growing at exponential rates. The federal government is also uh, doing a little bit with nutrition education, a little bit, but not nearly enough. Um, nutrition education that has to compete with billions of dollars that's being put into anti-nutrition education, or let's call it obesity education, by food businesses. And then we have a few really great programs, like USDA's Community Food Project's Competitive Grants Program. Still a tiny, tiny program uh, when you look at total, total federal spending on research and good programs. This uh, is, is the cover of a study that was done at its decade celebration in, what was that, March 2007, I think, the first decade of the Community Food Projects program. And I think there have been Community Food Projects in Maine, right? Several? Okay, great, great, glad to hear it. Because I think that's a wonderful program. It just doesn't have enough money. That's the biggest, the biggest issue. It's helping to connect farmers with these low-income people who really need food. Other things that are being done, and I should have had MACFA symbol up here, these are two of the, the national NGOs that are working for healthy food and better access to healthy food for everyone. The Community Food Security Coalition, I've been working with this group for, oh, uh, about eight years. I've been on the governing board. Uh, the Food Security Learning Center, which is run out of Why Hunger, based in New York, providing information about food insecurity and the kinds of ways that people are addressing food insecurity. And some efforts now uh, that have gained momentum to make sure that people who are buying real food in farmers markets or farm stands are able to pay with food stamps, able to use their food stamps in these venues. 
They can use electronic benefit transfers in farmers markets in many places in the country now, but unfortunately not everywhere because we still don't have uh, electronic benefit transfer machines in every farmers market in the country. That should be a priority. That's a real no-brainer. And then farm to school. Another thing that is good for farmers in some places where the school districts are able to pay decent prices for the food that farmers bring in. Kids get fresh food, they get contact with local farmers. Usually farm to school programs are combined with nutrition education and farm education. This can be wonderful and the evaluation results from farm to school programs have really been superb. We just don't have enough. The programs have been growing exponentially. There were over 2,000 programs in the United States uh, this year. Um, last year, we were only counting 2009. We were just counting a little over 1,000 programs. So this is a, a remarkable increase in farm to school programs, partly because it makes so much sense. And it's something that people can do even though things are really screwed up at the federal level. They can work for farm to school programs in their own school districts, in their own regions, their own states. I want to introduce another approach that I think needs a lot more traction in the United States. And that's changing the way that we look at food. So as a country, we no longer view food as a privilege, healthy food, as a privilege that should only go to people who can afford to pay for it, but as a right that goes to every single person in the country. Rights-based approaches are being adopted internationally. They're being adopted in just about every other country except the United States because they really make a difference. They help to provide healthy food and basic needs to every person in that country. Rights-based approaches are based in a Declaration of Human Rights that was signed in 1948 by all countries, including the United States. The United States has not uh, signed the covenant, 1966 covenant, on economic, social, and cultural rights. And some officials in the United States will insist that, that actually feels good. <laughs> cool air. Uh, some officials will insist that, that the United States does not support the right to food. There was a vote taken in the United Nations General Assembly in uh, November of 2008 that basically just endorsed the right to food and said it's intolerable that so many people are dying of hunger and suffering from malnutrition in a world that can feed everyone now. The United States was the only country that failed to endorse this move to simply repeat what had already been accepted by all countries, the right to food. The United States has to support it because we signed the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the right to food is basically there, even though it's been elaborated in these later covenants and declarations. So that's a little bit of weasel work for the U.S. administration to be saying that we don't support the right to food. Rights-based approaches basically put vulnerable people, and that includes all these kids who aren't getting the right kind of food. It includes all those people who are hungry for real food. It puts those people in the very center of the focus as rights holders, people who deserve to have healthy food. And it sets up a whole process in which these vulnerable people have the right to participate in any kind of policy, any kind of decision that affects their right to healthy food. So these federal policies about subsidies that are so skewed, vulnerable people who are suffering from food insecurity and obesity should have a say in what kinds of federal policies we're supporting. It sets up mechanisms of accountability at every level so that if people aren't getting healthy food and aren't able to enjoy their right to healthy food, they have immediate recourse. The basic idea with rights-based approaches is that the state is responsible for filling basic human rights of all citizens and all citizens are rights holders. That's you, me, everybody. 
States that don't do this are considered failed states. States that don't provide for the basic needs of all their citizens are failed states. We have a custom in this country of pointing to other countries and saying, ah, oh, failed states or human rights abuses. But we are doing exactly the same thing when it comes to the right to food within the United States. This idea about food as a basic human right is a little, a little hard to grasp. And I think it helps sometimes to compare it with education, which we do consider a human right in this country. Provision of education is something that we take for granted. The state is going to make sure that our kids have schools. Uh, the government, that's one of the primary responsibilities. It's one of the main reasons that we pay taxes uh, in addition to keeping the IRS people from snooping around at our front door. Food, in contrast, we have a needs-based approach to food where you have to prove that you're low income and you don't have enough food in order to get food stamps or get any kind of assistance. And the process for getting this is humiliating and sometimes really um, difficult to go through. You have to show up at a government office to apply. It's not a process that preserves people's dignity. This uh, photo at the bottom is um, soup lines through the 1930s, but it's not all that different nowadays in pantries around the country. So accepting the right to food would mean not that we're just giving food away to everybody. Some people say, oh, we can't have a right to food because that, that would take away the incentive to work. It means that for people who, for various reasons, cannot enjoy that right, they should be able to get healthy food easily, conveniently, in affordable ways that meet their own income. And if they simply don't have an income because of disability, or they, they're immobilized, then the government makes sure that they get that food through ways that preserve their dignity, not through ways that make them feel that they're taking a handout. So, um, let me recapitulate uh, what farmers can do now. The options that don't punish farmers by forcing them to take lower prices and basically exploiting their own labor on their farms. They can participate in farm to school programs and farm to institution programs where they exist and where people are willing to pay decent prices. You can work for those farm to school programs too, try to make sure that they're in place in your school districts. Farmers can take advantage of subsidized sales at farm stands, farmers markets, or through CSAs. That's either by food stamps, the electronic benefit transfers, or by private subsidies. There's a big foundation, the Wholesome Wave Foundation, and several private foundations in the United States now, and a lot of very generous people who are subsidizing low-income people's access to healthy food at farm stands and farmers markets. Even though this has kind of taken off as a, a trend in the United States, and a lot of people point to what they call um, bounty bucks in Boston or double bucks in some other parts of the, the country where you can go into farmers markets or farm stands and buy twice as much healthy food that's locally grown with your uh, farmers market money as you could um, buying other things, it's really not the complete solution. Because for low income people, getting to farmer stands and farmer's markets is not, that's not enough. A lot of low income people live in places where they don't have access to these kinds of markets. Or it's not convenient for them. It doesn't fit in with working three jobs. You can also work with distributors who are committed to fair pricing and making good food widely available. Fortunately, there's some of these innovative, creative distributors in the Northeast. Crown of Maine in, in this state, Red Tomato in uh, Massachusetts and working through the entire Northeast region. Trying hard to give fair, farmers fair prices and also make sure that healthy food gets out to low income customers, gets out to the places where low income people shop. 
Some of the ways that they're experimenting, um, I know Red Tomato is doing this, I don't know about Crown of Maine, is selling produce that doesn't quite meet the grade uh, in terms of size or color or whatever, like the apples that, that aren't quite big enough, but are still just right for, for little kids' hands. Selling those at a slightly lower price so at least farmers can gain some income for this, uh, these products that they can't sell through their usual channels. And then finally, I really can't say it enough, farmers need to be participating in policy change efforts. I know you're sending Russell off to Washington to fight for food safety regulations that uh, help small farmers, but there are a lot of other ways that farmers need to be engaged in policy change efforts. The National Campaign for Sustainable Agriculture is one of the places that tracks policies that are friendly to farmers and will send out alerts to remind you of when you need to be notifying your senators and Congress people. Uh, Community Food Security Coalition also does the same thing. So please join these groups. We need to raise the numbers of people who are protesting these insane food policies that we have in this country. So my conclusion, it's a little bleak, I, I told Russell it would be bleak, but I'm afraid that's simply the situation we're dealing with in the country right now. There's plenty of money that's being made in the food system. It's not an issue of lack of money. Places like uh, Walmart with their super centers that are selling most of the produce in, to people in the United States now are making money hand over fist. The people who control those companies are making money hand over fist. Agribusiness is thriving in this country. Policy changes are desperately needed to allow farmers to make healthy food that's grown with environmentally sound practices more widely available. Farmers' options are severely limited now in ways that they absolutely should not be by any consideration, by public health, by rights uh, considerations, by moral considerations, by common sense. Farmers' options are limited because of all the perverse subsidies and policies that effectively lock out low-income consumers from healthy food. Ensuring that citizens' basic needs and rights are met is a core function of our government, and we need to keep their toes to the fire, make sure that's happening. The U.S. government is failing farmers and citizens by failing to recognize the right to food, by failing to make living wages mandatory for everyone, including farm workers, by providing the wrong kinds of subsidies for unhealthy foods, for ethanol, for agribusiness companies, by not paying for ecosystem services, all the ways that you folks are supporting healthy ecosystems, clean water, clean air, because of your choices to use environmentally sound practices. You're not getting subsidized for that, but you could be. Um, and then a host of other policies, but those are the ones that I really want to point out as being uh, most in need of immediate change. Now, fortunately, you are moving on to some very uh, pragmatic and inspiring workshops. So you will be getting a lot of useful information about how to make the best of your own farm, how to make the best of your own situations. But I do want for you to keep in mind the main messages here that we've got to keep fighting for policy changes. We can't give up even though the situation at the federal level is not very helpful right now after the November election. We need to be building those alternatives so that as soon as we, we are able to put a groundswell of change into Washington and into every governor's office around the country, the alternatives will be up and running and people will be able to switch. Alternatives that provide healthy food for everyone. Thank you. And I'm open to questions if anyone uh, wants to ask. Questions? Yeah. So, I, so say we do have policy changes that 
change the way we subsidize fresh foods? How are we still going to compete with marketing for these junk foods? Like, are you do you suggest that SNAP benefits don't aren't like you can't buy potato chips with SNAP benefits, or how do you think you do that without getting this like nanny state label? That's become really controversial, especially with with. Yeah, uh, the question is excellent. It's uh, how are we going to deal with all the the marketing that's being done for junk foods without becoming a nanny state where we're telling people what to buy, what they can and can't buy. New York State uh, is proposing to ban purchases of soda with uh, food stamps. And I know it's extremely controversial, and I understand the arguments on both sides there. But it really seems to me that we should not be providing federal funds to subsidize purchases of unhealthy foods because those purchases, in effect, hurt poor people and they prop up the companies that are already making way too much money by selling that unhealthy food. I know, I, I work with Ed Cooney at the Congressional Hunger Center and he would be having a heart attack in the back of the room if he heard me saying that. I understand the arguments that it's really important for people who don't have adequate incomes to be able to have free choice of foods, but at the same time, it simply seems wrong to me to be subsidizing those purchases with food stamps. So I would say yes, if, if you really must have Coca-Cola, buy it, but don't buy it with food stamps. Use your food stamps for the healthy food purchases. And we know that at $133 per person per month, those food stamps could cover healthy food and there'd still be a long way to go just to fill people's bellies. So nobody's making it on food stamps alone. And I'll probably get some, some pushback on that one. Yes? Are there any examples that you know of, of um food access uh, and uh, increasing with, with private dollars and uh, also like driving an agricultural economy in a region, the sustainable agricultural economy being driven by private dollars that also increase food access? I think to some extent we're seeing that with foundations in the Northeast. And there are a lot of innovations that have started in the Northeast. The question was about whether I'm seeing any, um, any drive by private money to uh, implement regional food systems that provide better access to healthy food. And I think there are a lot of foundations uh, that really want to do that. I think there's a lot of confusion, frankly about what the best strategies are. For instance, these uh, bounty bucks, the double your money at, at farmer's markets, that's really gotten a lot of publicity among foundations recently. And I think it's good, but it's just not enough. It should not be the main place where foundations are investing. There's a new slow money main group that started up, and I think that's uh, very useful in providing very low interest loans to farmers to help you get to the next stage um, where you can start earning a little more money, uh, getting a little more revenue from your own property and your own assets. So there are a lot of foundations that are really interested in that. But my sense is that we need a real concerted effort that involves citizens, the non-governmental organizations, including all the farmer organizations that have been working for decades on improving farm policy, improving rural policy, improving environmental policy, and improving hunger policy. We need a national forum to really work through how are we going to deal with this problem and how are we going to deal with it without allowing agribusiness to continue scooping all the cream off the top, which keeps happening. The, the money that's funneled into food system change continues to be skimmed off by agribusiness. It, not, not a very cheerful answer, I'm afraid, but I think there are foundations that, that understand the issues, care desperately about them, and really want to make a change. And those foundations are active in Maine. 
We shouldn't have to have foundations doing this, frankly, folks. Foundations are stepping into a gap that has been created, a big sucking vacuum, because the government has reneged on its responsibility to meet the right to healthy food for everyone. So we do turn to private foundations because those are the folks who have the money now, but it's not, it's not where we should have to look. Yeah, question in the back? Sure. When you talk about the right to healthy food, I, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on the economic underpinnings of what that looks like. Is that something an extension of our existing programs, or is this a, a new government entity that you're talking about? I think it could be an, an extension of some of our existing programs. Um, it seems clear to me that people who don't have sufficient access for income reasons to healthy food should be receiving subsidies, and they should be getting a high enough subsidy that they can afford to buy healthy food, not junk food. That would make a big difference, and that's basically an increase of a subsidy program. That subsidy program and the fact that we're spending more than half of the farm bill, the so-called farm bill, uh, of which a relatively small proportion actually goes to farms, uh, most of it's going into these food assistance programs, um, that the fact that that exists is because people aren't employed and aren't getting living wages for the work that they do. So those are things that need to change too. We've done it before in this country. We can do it again. There's no question about that with sufficient political will. We can provide jobs for people and we can provide jobs that pay adequate wages so that they can eat healthy food. So it's a continuation of some of the programs but also a reorientation of other programs. For instance, in some countries where the right to food is written into the Constitution, Brazil is an example, Ecuador is another example, there are programs in place that are buying produce from um, small farmers, healthy produce, and then providing it back out at a subsidy to low-income people or in neighborhoods where a lot of low-income people live, <coughs> providing it back out at very low prices. So basically subsidizing farmers for growing healthy food, but making sure that that food goes to the people who most need it. And we really don't have something like that in this country. The Community Food Projects Program at USDA is, has the same principles in play where it's small farmers, low-income farmers who are supposed to be linked up with low-income consumers, but it's so small. It's, it's a little tiny point of light in the midst of a whole sea of um, dollars that are going in the wrong direction. Yeah, Russell. Right. So I'm going to take last question. Um, 2012 is the Farm Bill. Congress rewrites federal food policy every five years. What's the one thing you'd like to see happen in 2012? Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the one thing. I think, and I have to say this, Russell, it's going to sound, Russell is asking what I would most like to see in 2012. The thing I would most like to see, and I'm, I'm sliding around your answer first, is an end to these secret campaign donations by corporations. Because I think the amount of money that's flowing into campaigns now that doesn't have to be identified, that's coming from big business, is outrageous. So that's what I would most like to see in 2012, and I think that would make a big difference overall. But in terms of the farm bill, what I would like to see is that it be recognized as a food bill and that the top priority of the food bill become providing healthy food to everyone and that every single program within the food bill be carefully examined with that motivation in mind. If it doesn't serve that purpose, then it must be changed. And I could get into lots of details. Uh, those of you who are considering going down to Albany next weekend, I hope there's a, a whole group of you. The Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group is holding a, a conference called It Takes a Region in Albany, New York, and there will be a Farm Bill listening session there 
that's hosted by the Community Food Security Coalition and NISOM. And that's one of the places there should be listening sessions like this going on all around the country now that is eliciting comments from people at the grassroots, people who are dealing with these bad policies that we have in place and saying, these are my top priorities for the Farm Bill, and then taking those priorities up to the federal level and supporting them throughout. It's going to take concerted support by all of us to make a real change in the Farm Bill. We made some changes in 2008, we need to go even farther to make this a healthy food bill in 2012. Thank you, Molly. So I did forget um, a couple other announcements. Reminder, check out. Also, um, stop in to visit the vendors as they, uh, as they set up for lunch. John Carroll reminded me that people have been looking for his book. He'll be there ahead of lunchtime. Um, and thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, farm lives and coming to share your experiences with everyone. So see you in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone.